Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for, uh, for coming back for round two. Uh, what I'm going to try to do this morning is to touch on a subject which, uh, which gets a lot of attention, and that's the settlements. And I've titled the talk, uh, The Settlements, The Great Settlement Debate, 45 Years and 45 Minutes. Uh, see if we can get that in. I, I just want to start by saying that um, I live, in, I live in, a, in a community outside of the Green Line, uh, a community known as Mali Domin, which is actually the third largest uh, community, the third largest settlement uh, outside of the Green Line. We've got about 40,000 people. And in 2004, 2005, right before the withdrawal from Gaza, remember in 2005, Israel did what, what the world and the Palestinians had, had called upon it to do for so long, and it removed 21 settlements and some 10,000 Jews from Gaza. And while I live in Maladamim, we had a guest speaker in my synagogue on a, on a Shabbat morning, and he said the people were him nuts asking what will be. What will be? What's going to happen after Israel removes the settlements? What's going to happen to the settlers? What's going to happen to the rockets? What's going to happen to Hamas? Where's it all going? He said one man kind of was driving him crazy day after day after day, asking him, what will be? My year. What will be? And he said he took this guy to the corner. He said, look, we're Jews. As Jews, we believe in the long run, in the end, it'll all work out. In the end, it'll all be good. In the end, there'll be peace. In the end, everything will be fine and harmonious. It'll be wonderful. Your problem, he said to the man, was you're born in the middle. And I think that kind of does categorize or, or in, encapsulate our situation. We're in the middle of major events that are transforming the region, like I spoke about on Friday. Iran's nuclear march, the disintegration of Syria, the changes that are happening in Egypt, the Hamas, Fatah reconciliation. These are all major events that are changing everything. But no matter what's going on everywhere else, no matter what's going on in Syria, no matter what's going on in Egypt, no matter what's going on anywhere else in the region, one issue that's always going to be out there front and center is the settlements, the settlement issue, right? It's the evergreen, it's the, it's, it's the foundation, it's, 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 it's the rock that is always going to be at the center of Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Up until the Arab Spring in 2011, in fact, much of the world looked at the settlements as the main source of instability, not only between Israel and the Palestinians, but in the entire Middle East, right? If this issue, if the settlement issue was just solved, if Israel just uprooted the settlements, not only would that bring peace in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but stability throughout the entire Middle East, right? Peace between Israel and the Palestinians, President Barack Obama said in his famous speech in Cairo in 2009, peace, he said, would, quote, have a profound and positive impact on the entire Middle East and North Africa. And the cornerstone of that peace, he made clear with his surprise demand that all settlement construction everywhere had to stop, the cornerstone of that peace would be stopping any settlement activity. Right? Stopping the settlements was key, he indicated, in this whole piece that would then reverberate throughout the region. Get rid of the settlements, the argument ran, and you would unlock the door to Middle East stability. No less. And then the Arab Spring hit, and that argument la lost all of its validity. Right? The Tunisian fruit salesman who set himself a fire did so, and, and, and he set himself a, 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 on fire, and by doing so, sparked flames in the region that are still being felt today. Believe me, he did not do so because of the settlements. The Egyptians did not unseat Mubarak and then Mercy because of the settlements. Right? And Bashar Assad, the Syrian dictator, is not killing his people by the tens of thousands because of a building going up in the West Bank settlements. Right? The Israeli-Palestinian conflict provided a convenient crutch, a convenient crutch for the world, blinders, to keep them from seeing the Middle East before the Arab Spring as the dysfunctional place that it was. It was easy to just blame the settlements for all the problems in the Middle East, but that was a crutch. The Middle East was unstable. This argument, this argument ran that the Middle East was unstable because of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was continuing because of the settlements. 
Solve the settlement issue, therefore, and you solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and you provide peace and stability and security in the Middle East. Ah, were it just so easy? Were that just the magic wand? Just as the Palestinian, just as Israeli-Palestinian peace is not the magic key to forging stability in the Middle East, because even if we would sign an agreement today with the Palestinians, that would not solve the problems in Egypt, in Syria, or elsewhere in the Arab world, right? The Arab, the Arab Spring has shown that neither two, neither two is solving the settlement issue necessarily going to be the magic wand that solves the whole Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The settlements are a sexy issue, it's a photogenic issue, it's an emotional issue, it's an issue that rouses up passions because some Jews claim that they're sitting there because God gave them the land, something that is so un-21st century, something that doesn't resonate well in this century, right? But the settlements are not the central issue. How, can, how do I know that? How can I say that when it seems so clear when you read the media that it's just the settlements? I can say that because the Israeli-Arab conflict predated the settlements by half a century. Right? The Arabs rioted against the Jews in 1921, in 1929, in 1936, in 1939, before there was even an Israel, let alone a settlement. Right? In 1947, the Palestinians, the Arabs, turned down the two-state solution proposed by the UN again before anyone dreamed of a settlement going up in a place called Shiloh or Ofra. Terrorism, terrorism has been an evil part of the landscape in Israel ever since the Jews started coming back to Israel en masse, and it continued immediately after the establishment of the state in 1948. The Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, was established in 1964, three years before the Six-Day War, three years before 67 when Israel took control of Judea and Samaria and began the settlements, right? It's, they, they began, PLO began in 1964. The Palestinian Liberation Organization began before there was a, a settlement. What were they trying to liberate? There were no settlements. What were exactly were they to liberate? What was that all about, right? While convenient, it's very convenient now to pin the conflict on the settlements, the conflict far predates the settlements and is about fundamental question, the right of the Jews to be in Israel in any borders whatsoever, something that the Arabs have not yet accepted. Right? The conflict at its roots, I believe, is not about a Palestinian state. We've said that we're willing to create a Palestinian state. The conflict at its roots, the one that has been simmering now for nearly half a century, or, or nearly a century, is over a Jewish state and whether there's a right for a Jewish state to be anywhere in the region. The settlements are a convenient excuse, but they are not the core issue, and I think it's important to keep that in mind when you read about the settlements. The core issue is whether Jews have the right to a nation state anywhere in the historic, biblical homeland of the Jewish people. Those who deny us that right find it convenient to pin the whole conflict on the settlement. It's just a pretext, it's just an excuse. But it's a strong pretext and it's a strong excuse which is discussed much and, and, and needs to be considered. So what I want to do now for the remainder of the time is to kind of look at the whole settlement enterprise and where we are today and where we're going. I'd like to look at the issue from two different perspectives. The first is a brief historical overview laying out the issues, defining terms, and showing how Israel's own attitudes towards the settlements have changed dramatically over the last 45 years. And secondly, just to look briefly at the settlement issue in light of the current diplomatic process. But before I start, I want to just uh, have one, one more slight digression. But I think it's a digression that bears upon the subject I'm talking about and it goes back to what I said Friday night, that everything in Israel has to be seen within the prism of security, of what ensures security. Israel, like I said the other night, Israel 2014 is not the same country that it was before the Second Intifada in 2000, in September 2000. The Second Intifada, in my mind, will be looked at by historians as kind of a watershed in Israeli history 
to a certain degree, the same type of watershed that the 73 war was, the Yom Kippur War, and the 67 war, because again, it changed, like I said the other night, it changed everybody's mentality. The country was changed dramatically by the terrorism of, of those years. If before the Intifada, if before September 2000, there were many in Israel who thought that if you just remove the settlements, all would be fine, that conception in Israel, to a large degree, has gone out the window as a result of terror and as a result of the non-stop violence from Gaza that ensued after we uprooted the 21 settlements from, from Gaza. Right? And that's an, that's an important thing to be stressed. In 2005, Ariel Sharon, who was then the, the Prime Minister, did what everybody wanted Israel to do, had been wanting Israel to do for years, had been calling on Israel to do for so long, and he destroyed 21 settlements in Gaza and cleared out every Jew from Gaza. There's very few places on the planet where no Jew exists or is able to trod, where he can't step. The one, one of the areas where that is, is in Gaza. In fact, it's in an area where there was a Jewish presence in antiquity. But Sharon took the Jews out of Gaza, uprooted the settlements, and what did we see? The belief of much of the world that if you just uprooted the settlements, everything would be fine. And if you merely dismantle the settlements, peace would flow like a river, right? That has kind of lost a lot of its traction, a lot of its resonance inside Israel after the withdrawal from Gaza because we saw what happened. Withdrawal from Gaza Uprooting the 21 settlements there did not improve Israel's security situation. But in the West Bank, if you remove the settlements, if you withdraw, why the situation in the West Bank would fundamentally be any different than the situation in Gaza was. Then, however, if you withdraw, if you uproot the settlements from the West Bank and you withdraw, then the rockets could fall not on a small town in the Negev of 40,000 people, Shterot, but rather in Tel Aviv. There was, during the 1990s, when people said, there was a time during the 1990s, during the heyday of the Oslo Accords, right, when, when many Israelis said, why am I guarding the settlements? They add nothing to the country's security, and they are just the whim they're just the desire of the religious fanatics. This was a period when you heard people say that they did not want to have their kids risk their lives guarding some nutty settlers out there on some deep, deep inside the Palestinian territories. Today, you hear that argument less as there's more realization that the settlements did play a security role because where the settlements are, the army is, and where the army is, the terrorists are not on the hills lobbing missiles into Israel. Which brings me back to my original topic now, settlements, 40 years and 45 minutes. First of all, we have to define terms, what a settlement is. I think it's important, if you would come to a place where I live, I live, like I said, in Mar Adumim, which is just 10 minutes to the east of Jerusalem. And if you would come to my house, I imagine, and you come to my neighborhood, I imagine that what you would see would look substantially different than how you envision a settlement to look. It's modern, it's suburban, it's 10 minutes from Jerusalem, it's large, right? It's also one of the five settlement blocks that most Israelis feel Israel has to hold onto in any future agreement with the Palestinians. There's five blocks, Maladimim is one of them, Gush Etzion, which is in the news these days, unfortunately, because that's where these three boys were kidnapped on Friday, is another one. Ariel to the north, Givat Zev, and a corridor of settlements that are very close to the Green Line in the central region, kind of protecting Ben Gurion Airport. Uh, that's the fifth region. Those are what's called settlement blocks, which is very much a part of the Israeli consensus that Israel needs to hold on to for security, for security for security needs. If you would come to one of those settlements, like I said, you would not see what you imagine a settlement to be. The popular image, the popular stereotype of a settlement, of course, is a long beard. But when you come to my community, you'll see that the reality is vastly, vastly different. 
Now, it's not that that image, that stereotype doesn't exist. It does, but it's the vast minority. It's the vast minority. Of the 350,000 Israelis who live in settlements outside of Jerusalem, and I'll get to the Jerusalem issue in a minute, but 350,000 Jews live beyond the Green Line. Of those, about 70 to 80 percent of them live in bedroom communities like mine in Mayudamim. Right? They live in settlements like those which are very, very close to the Green Line and are very, very much a part of the Israeli political consensus. They were drawn there, they were drawn there more by cheaper housing, fresh air, and a better quality of life than a desire to sleep where Abraham the patriarch walked. Right? Now there's another 80,000 to 100,000, I'd say, who could be termed the hardcore ideological settlers who went to those areas out of a feeling that the Jews have the right to live everywhere in Eretz Yisrael. But it's a vast, it's a vast minority of the 350,000 Israelis who make up the settlements today. Now 350,000 people is not a small number of people. It's about 16% of the entire Arab population in Judea and Samaria, the Arab population in the West Bank. And to give you some perspective of that, right, 16% Jews in the West Bank, there's 20% Israeli Arabs inside Israel. So it just kind of gives you a certain perspective. One of the popular misconceptions of the whole settlement enterprise is that they're solely or they're entirely the legacy of the national religious or the Likud party. It's true that the image of a group of kippah-clad kids taking over a hill in the middle of the night, that image seeped deep into people's consciousness during the Likud years of the late 70s and early 80s, the heyday of what's called the Gush Imunim period. But the settlements around Jerusalem, like where I live, and the settlements in the Jordan Valley, and the settlements in Gush Etzion, south of Jerusalem, in the Golan Heights, and even in Sinai, which were uprooted as part of the Camp David Accords, those settlements were not set up by Likud. Those settlements were set up by labor governments and fit into the popular strategic conception that existed in Israel at the time. My domain, where I live, was set up in 1975, almost 40 years ago, under a labor government led by Yitzhak Rabin. Right? And at the time, it fit into the popular strategic conception that everybody had during that period. But strategic conceptions, how we view our strategic environment, strategic conceptions are fluid, they change. And the settlement movement has both benefited and been hurt, has suffered over the last 40 years as our strategic conceptions of what we think is important for our strategic reality has changed. Now the popular strategic conception that you hear all the time is two states for two people, right? That's, that's, it's, it's, it's an two states for two people. But that was not always the case. That's something that's relatively recent. For example, when the settlements were set up in the Jordan Valley, right, along the Jordan River, when they were set up around Jerusalem and in Gush Etzion, in the early 1970s, what was being discussed at the time was not two states for two peoples, but rather some kind of West Bank federation between a Palestinian autonomous area and Jordan. And in Israel at the time, with that conception in mind, that there would be some federation with Jordan between the Palestinian areas, at that time what Israel tried to do was set up settlements surrounding Jerusalem in order to protect Jerusalem and maintain that it retains a part of Israel, and also a ribbon of settlements along the Jordan River for security reasons, with the idea that any invading army from the east is going to have to go across the Jordan River, so you want to have settlements along the river. But again, that was the rationale behind that was all security. The rationale behind that was that Israel needed this ribbon as a buffer zone to protect Israel from invasion from the east, which we had in the past, and that the settlements would serve as a security buffer. The settlements would lay the marker for what the country believed it had to hold on to for defensible borders. It thought that it needed the Jordan Valley for defensible borders, and it thought it needed the settlements around Jerusalem to keep Jerusalem a part of Israel. The settlement map in the early days was based primarily on security concerns, 
with the idea I said, as, with the idea being I said, to place the settlements in sparsely populated areas as a buffer. For instance, another example of this buffer philosophy was the establishment of the settlements in, in, in Gaza, in Gush Katif, this, the, the, the settlements that were, were uprooted in 2005. Those settlements were first put there for the same reasons. You had a, a band of settlements that was placed along the border between Gaza and Egypt in order to prevent there from being a contiguous area, from being one, one, one continuous area that there would be an Israeli presence b between Egypt and Gaza, much for the reason that we see happening today. We saw it happening uh, up until about a year ago when, when, when Sisi started to, to take very serious action against the arms smuggling. The settlements were put there so that there was not this, this, this ability to smuggle things in and out of Egypt, in and out of Sinai, into the Gaza Strip. That was the conception of, at the time inside Gaza. That's why the first settlements were set, were set up there in Gaza, again, as a buffer, as a security ribbon. With time, and as the Likud thickened the settlements in Gaza, the idea also there became, began not only to be a buffer between Gaza and Egypt in the south, but also a buffer on the western side of Gaza. The settlements in Gaza were placed right along the border, the western border, close to Israel. And the idea then as well was kind of a security border. Now this idea which many people, when we, when, we, when we drew from Gaza in 2005, people thought that, well, this, this whole security idea of having the settlements in Gaza was no longer relevant. Believe me, when Israel withdrew and the Palestinians began to shoot their missiles onto Israeli cities from the communities that were withdrawn, from the settlements that were uprooted, people realized, people realized that that whole philosophy, that whole strategic philosophy was not necessarily mistaken. Back then, in the early years, it was less the settlers pushing the hand of the government and more the government using the settlers to promote its own strategic security vision of what was needed to ensure the security of the country. But in Israel, which is a fickle country, strategic security visions change often and as they've changed, so has the role and the purpose and the, the way the country looks at the settlements. With the rise of Menachem Begin in 1977 and Likud, the settlements changed. The reason the government set the settlements up, they changed fundamentally. And they were not only approved to be set up anymore in sparsely populated Palestinian areas because of security concerns, but rather they were also put up in densely uh, in densely populated Palestinian areas for religious, historical, ideological reasons, right, and the belief that the Jews have a historic religious right to live everywhere in Eretz Israel. Begin's first act as Prime Minister in 1977, his first act after he won the Torah scroll, go to a settlement nucleus in Samaria at an army camp there and say that there would be many more Elon Morez, many more settlements built in, in, in this area. This was the heyday of Gush Emunim, when the impression was created very much both in Israel and abroad that the settlers were now pushing the government's hand. It wasn't the government who was leading the policy. The settlers were saying, we need to, we need to live here and there and there, and they were pushing the government's hand. Begin also wanted to preclude, Begin wanted to stop the establishment of a Palestinian state. He was afraid of the, of the establishment of a Palestinian state, and he thought that by sprinkling the settlements in these areas, in the densely populated areas in Judea and Samaria, he would preclude, he would, he would make sure that a Palestinian state would not be able to emerge. And then, in 1992, Likud lost the elections. Right? And again, the country's strategic vision changed fundamentally. This was the beginning of the Oslo period. This was an election that the Likud, the Yitzhak Shamir, lost to Yitzhak Rabin. And at this time, the idea that was very much, very much popular in the country at the time was that if Israel would just make the necessary concessions, right, land for peace, give up the settlements, then peace would begin to flow. That's when Rabin, Yitzhak Rabin, sowed the seed in the consciousness of the nation that certain settlements might have to be uprooted. 
He made a distinction. Rabin made a distinction between what he called security settlements. Settlements which in his eyes were legitimate because they were set up for security reasons to defend the country and political settlements which he did not see legitimate, which he thought were set up for political reasons, for religious reasons, and which he did not favor and he didn't want to stay there. The historical ideological and religious rationale for the settlements, the idea that we should have these settlements because we have a right to them, because Jews have a right to live everywhere in the God-promised land of Israel, that sentiment never really took firm hold among the Israeli population. And when the country's overall strategic attitude began to change, when it thought that peace could be negotiated with the Arabs, the view of the settlements among the Israeli public changed to a great deal correspondingly. If you set up settlements for strategic or security reasons, not for religious reasons, not for historical reasons, but if you set the settlements up because of security needs, when those needs change, or your perception of those needs change, then the settlements become expendable. Become expendable. Then you can remove the settlements. Right? The best illustration of this can be seen by studying the case of Ayo Sharon. Right? Ayo Sharon was the godfather of the settlement movement. He set dozens and dozens of settlements up where they are now, motivated by the security concept that the settlements were needed to keep the Palestinians at a distance to keep Palestinian missiles from being aimed at Ben Gurion Airport. And that's an important distinction, right? He was, he, he set up the map on security, security considerations. When the pool of ideological settlers began to dry up in the 1980s, right? The number of people who are It was Sharon, during the government of Yitzhak Shamir, who came up with the idea of creating bedroom communities near Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, where city dwellers would move to improve their living conditions. And this was where you had a mass influx of settlers during this period, but again, it was settlers going to bedroom communities not motivated by any religious ideology. Yet what happened to Sharon? Right? What happened to Ariel Sharon? How did the architect of the settlement movement end up being the first prime minister, or the second prime minister, because Begin removed settlements from Sinai. But the first prime minister to remove settlements in the West Bank, how was Ariel Sharon, the guy who was the godfather of the settlement movement, how did he do it? It's important to remember in explaining that, that he set up the settlements again, not because of religious or ideological settlement. He was not Gush Munim. He did not want to walk where Abraham slept. Right? It was strategic. He set up the bedroom communities, like I said, because he thought that they would prevent missiles from being aimed at Tel Aviv. And after becoming Prime Minister, dealing with the Second Intifada, and seeing the panoply of the, the, the whole wide array of pressure against Israel, right? In 2001, he was the Prime Minister. The Second Intifada was taking a huge toll. George Bush in Israel is remembered fondly, right? He's, he's, seen, he's seen to a large extent as a very pro-Israel president. And one of the reasons for that was that during this period of the Second Intifada, Bush gave Sharon a carte blanche. He gave, the, he gave Sharon a free hand to do what he he done to bring down the violence, right? He did not stop Sharon. If Sharon felt he had to move back into the Palestinian cities, Bush let him move back into the Palestinian cities. And what this created, though, in Sharon was a certain sense that he needed to tighten the strategic cooperation with the U.S., and the U.S. wanted to see something in return. And I think Sharon, one of the reasons he left uh, Gaza, not the only reason, but one of the reasons, I think he made the following calculation. He said, it is more important for me to have a close strategic relationship cooperation with Washington, the settlements some of the settlements are getting in the way of that, so I'm willing to sacrifice the settlements, I'm willing to sacrifice the home on that settlement hill in order to have a closer relationship with Capitol Hill, which is one of the reasons I think that he actually went through with the withdrawal from Gaza in 2005. I interviewed What did you get? 
Sharon, what did you get? What are you getting from uprooting 10,000 people and creating this huge trauma inside the country? And his answer was, what did I get? I got a letter from President George Bush, and he would wave the letter, and he would say, this letter says that I can retain the large settlement blocks, the areas that I talked about in the beginning, areas like Mali Dimim and Gush Etzion. The Palestinians will have to recognize that there are demographic changes that need to be taken into consideration when considering the final map. The refugees cannot come back into Israel proper, the descendants of refugees, as I've been pointed out here. We're not talking about Palestinian refugees because most of those have died out. We're talking about the descendants of descendants of refugees who've never been absorbed elsewhere in the world. Right? The letter said they didn't have to come back. And the letter also said that Israel, America recognizes Israel's right to defend itself by itself against any possible threat, which Sharon interpreted as, a, as an American commitment they will not hold us back if we feel that we have to take any kind of action against Iran. So when you asked Sharon what he got from, from, from leaving Gaza, he said, I got this letter, right? Instead of furthering peace, once he left, once he left, Sharon pulled out of Gaza because of this letter, and he uprooted the settlements. But instead of furthering peace, what this brought was a constant barrage of missiles on Israeli kibbutzim and towns from where Israel evacuated the settlements from Gaza. And another problem that was revealed by this whole incident with the letter was that when Bush was replaced by President Barack Obama, the U.S. stepped away from the letter. Right? The U.S. stepped away from these commitments saying that they were not by, bound by the commitments that Bush made in this letter. Right? But by that time, by the time that Hillary Clinton actually said that, Sharon was deep in a coma, and for Netanyahu, he was the person who had to deal with it, and that was a stinging blow. When Hillary Clinton said that the U.S. was not bound by this letter, it was a huge blow for Netanyahu. Now, all this flip-flopping, all these reversals inside Israel on the settlement issue, I think touches on one of the basic problems we have in getting our point, uh, uh, our, our message across abroad, right? And that's that we have difficulty. We've had difficulty um, defining well for the world what it is we want, right? The settlements are an important question because it defines your borders. But Israel ourselves were divided on what exactly we should do with the settlements on what, where exactly those borders should be. And this presents a real problem when you're presenting your case to the world, right? Because if I ask you what the Palestinians want, you can tell me at a bare minimum what the Palestinians want, and I talked about this on Friday night, they want a state at a bare minimum. This is what they're telling you. I think they want a lot more than they're telling you, but this is what they're telling you. At a bare minimum, they say, we want a state inside the 67 borders with Jerusalem as its, our capital and some kind of accommodation for the descendants of Palestinian refugees. That's what they'll tell you. Now, if I ask you what the Jews want, it's a lot more difficult for you to tell me because we've never to consensus on what we want on such a fundamental issue as the settlements. We've never decided for ourselves. We know what we want. We want, it, we want peace. We want to be a Jewish, demograph a Jewish democratic state. But where are the borders? What do you do with the settlements? We're still arguing about that among ourselves, and that puts us at a disadvantage when we're talking to the world. There was a great Middle East theorist, actually he was a baseball manager by the name of Yogi Berra, right? And he said something brilliant, Yogi Berra. He said, don't be surprised if when you wake up in the morning and you don't know where you're going, say depends on what the Palestinians will agree to, it depends on what the Europeans will say, but depends is not policy. You can't achieve what you don't define. And we've had difficulty over the last 40 years defining for ourselves what it is we want. And that's put us at a disadvantage. We saw this in real time last week. Right? There was a conference in Herzliya. There's a big security uh, diplomatic conference every year in Herzliya. And they had a debate on the peace process. And you had four leaders of the four coalition parties, the four parties inside the government. And each leader inside in that debate, each leader gave a, a speech. They didn't actually debate because it would, it would have been uh, completely impossible. But each party leader gave a, gave a speech. 
And one, one guy said that you should annex Area C. You should annex 60% of the territories. Another guy said if you annex one settlement, we're going to bring down the government. Another guy said that the status quo is okay. We can live with the status quo. And the fourth person, Sippy Livni, she was kind of wishing that the Oslo process would continue. So you had four different opinions inside the government, right? And that kind of that kind of defines one of our problems is we're unable for ourselves to define the situation. The flip-flopping or this 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 lack of clarity, I think, was misinterpreted back in 2009 by the Obama administration as a basic antipathy, a basic Israeli dislike among the Israeli public for the settlements or for the settlement enterprising, right? And I think, I think that's what Obama thought. He thought by reading the newspapers, by led to was a misstep by the administration and something that set a bad tone in the whole relationship between Obama and Netanyahu from the very, from the very beginning. And I'll get back to that in just a second, but before I, I get to that, I just want to discuss one other, one other issue as far as defining terms are, and that's I want to define what a settlement outpost is, and I want to talk for Settlement outposts, illegal settlement outposts, which you also read about in the newspapers, refer to small communities, wildcat communities, we say in English. They're not sanctioned by the government. Small wildcat communities that were set up since the late 1990s without government approval. Some of these were set up in an attempt to grab a hilltop before there was going to be an agreement. Others were protests against the government for negotiating with the Palestinians, and others were reaction to Palestinian terrorist attacks, right? If there's an attack, then you should go set up something somewhere out in Judea and Samaria. Um, I think it's important to note when you talk about these Israeli settlement outposts, Israel, the government, the government has not sanctioned a new settlement since the mid-1990s. Right? The government is not building settlements. When you hear about settlement construction, it's all construction that's taking place inside existing settlements. It's not as Israel is going out now and taking over new hills. They haven't done that in the last 20 years. There are dozens and dozens of these illegal, not dozens, dozens, there, there are dozens of these, these illegal settlement outposts. And Israel has pledged to remove them. Right? These communities have very little public support inside Israel, and they're populated largely by people that the Israeli public views as being wildly extremist or radical or religious extremist, right? And they make up the hard core of the, of the, of the, 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 the hard ideological settlers. Every government from Sharon's to Netanyahu has said that they will deal with these communities, but they haven't done so yet. And I think it will be very difficult for them to do so, although I think that they will and can remove them if they want to, I don't think you're going to see them take this kind of action, which would also be a big traumatic step for the country, until they can then turn to the people and say, we're taking this move, we're removing these Jews from their homes, we're destroying these homes, but look what we're getting in return. We're getting something from the Palestinians in return. Look, this is what we're doing that for. I think if there was something that they could wave and say, this is what we're getting in return, then they would take action. To pull people out of their homes, there's going to have to be something that they, they can wave to the public, some agreement, some Palestinian concession, to which, like I said, they can say, this is the reason that those people have to go through what they're going to have to go through. The Gaza disengagement, like I said, left a huge trauma, and that trauma... population, very far left-wing segments of the population would like to see the violent withdrawal of these settlers now, but the government's position, and this is Netanyahu's position, and it, was, it goes back to Sharon, was only do it at the last minute if you're getting something in return. The second thing I just want to talk about now for a second is Jerusalem. It's necessary, it's necessary when you talk about settlements to make a differentiation between Jerusalem and the West Bank, between Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. I mentioned that there were 350,000 Jews living beyond the Green Line. That's outside Jerusalem. 
There's another 200,000 Israelis who live in neighborhoods inside Jerusalem that were across the Green Line. These are new neighborhoods that didn't exist before 1967. Right? These are neighborhoods that are an integral part of the city, but they're outside the Green Line. Neighborhoods like, I don't know if you're familiar with, with the neighborhoods in Jerusalem, but neighborhoods with the names of Gilo, Neve Yaakov, Ramot, Pisgat Zeev, Ramat Shlomo, uh, French Hill. Uh, neighborhoods, these are the neighborhoods that were very much in the headlines when Vice President Joe Biden came to Israel back in 2010, and Israel said they were going to build 800 units. It was a unit in this neighborhood, one of the neighborhoods inside Jerusalem. Europe, Europe, including Norway, considers these neighborhoods settlements. Right? They consider them settlements. The U.S. position has changed. Right? At first, they didn't consider them settlements. Condi Rice kind of changed that. And now the Obama administration also refers to these neighborhoods as settlement. announced about a week ago that it will no longer refer to these neighborhoods as settlements and it will no longer refer to Jerusalem as occupied because that prejudges the final status of negotiations, right? Whether or not Jerusalem is occupied or not, or not is, 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 is something that is going to come up in the negotiations. Australia has taken the lead and said we're not going to call Jerusalem occupied. Australia's even said we're not going to call the West Bank occupied, we're going to call it disputed territories, which I think they have a, a very firm historic and legal leg to stand on. Now, while there are Israelis who think that in any type of agreement with the Palestinians, Jerusalem should be shared, hardly anyone really believes that the Jews are going to be evacuated from these neighborhoods, right? We don't see these settlements. There's a division in Israel regarding settlements beyond the West Bank, beyond the Green Line in the West Bank, but there's little debate inside the Israeli political body right now as to whether these neighborhoods in Israel should be given up or should be evacuated. Almost nobody believes that. Now this distinction between Jerusalem and the rest of the settlements, right, between the 200,000 Jews in Jerusalem, or in these neighborhoods in Jerusalem, and the 350,000 Jews who live beyond the, the Green Line inside the West Bank, that distinction is important when looking at the current settlement debate and also at disagreements that Israel has had with, with Washington over the issue. When Obama came to power in 2009, as we all know, he put the Middle East very high up on his agenda. He wanted very much to differentiate his policy towards the Arab world from Bush's policy towards the Arab world. So one of the first things he did when he came into power was call for a complete, absolute freeze on all settlement construction everywhere, including in Jerusalem. And this was a change of American policy. This took Netanyahu, by the way, very much by surprise. He was completely, this was, was something that was completely, completely unexpected. And I think by doing this, by making this change of American policy, I think Obama was motivated by the following considerations. First of all, I think this would help him, he thought that this would help him right in the beginning with the Arab world and improving U.S. credibility with the Arab states, which he wanted to do immediately because, again, he wanted to differentiate himself from George Bush. This was low-hanging fruit. Right? This was something that, that he could get a lot of applause from in the Arab world. He would get immediate gratific gratification from stating this position loudly that there must be a total settlement, settlement freeze. Plus, there was little support in Congress for the settlements. Right? The U.S. Congress is very, very supportive of Israel, but when it comes to settlements, it's tough for Congress also to back Israel. So he would be able to kind of bash or hit out at Israel without getting any pushback from his own Congress. Secondly, Obama made two assumptions which were mistaken about the Israeli public. The first was that they too, that the Israeli public also hates the settlements. And the second assumption he made was that the Israelis are so afraid of losing American support that if there's a disagreement between Netanyahu and Obama, and a disagreement between Jerusalem and Washington, the Israeli public will probably side with Washington because they don't want to lose Washington's support. But both of those assumptions, I think, proved mistaken and misguided 
And I think this needs to be kept in mind when looking at future disagreements we have with the Americans. First of all, Israelis, despite what you might read in our audits, Israelis do not hate the settlements. Peace now does not speak for the country. Right? Israelis might, might not like have, the Israelis might not have a lot of sympathy or support for the hardcore religious ideological settlements, or they might think that those illegal outposts are populated by kind of crazy people, but they don't hate Mare Domin. They don't hate Gush Etzion. They don't hate the Jordan Valley settlements. They don't hate Ariel. They don't hate those neighborhoods inside Jerusalem. In fact, they identify with them. Right? There's been an Israeli consensus about those areas for years. So when Obama said that all settlement construction everywhere has to be stopped, he appeared to the average Israeli as making unreasonable demands on us when he wasn't making similar demands on the Palestinians. And pressing the subject, pressing the subject hard, did not bring the Israeli public to rally around Obama, and I think as Obama thought, perhaps even bring down Netanyahu's government and bring to power Tsipi Livni. It didn't do that. Rather, the country rallied around Netanyahu. The problem, this problem, this, this, this problem with the U.S. over the issue, was compounded, was made worse by the administration's denial that there were any understandings that existed between Sharon and the Bush administration as to where Israel could build. Right? They denied that there were understandings, but there were understandings. And some people in the Bush administration came out and, 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 and acknowledged that there were understandings between Israel and Washington as to where Israel could build. The understanding was that Israel could build inside the settlement blocks, the main blocks that everyone realized or realizes that we're going to hold on to, that you could build inside those blocks. When Obama backtracked from that, from those agreements, when he denied that those agreements existed, it caused a crisis of faith with the Israeli public. How could the U.S. expect Israel to abide by agreements if, in our view, they weren't even abiding by their own agreements with us? There's another distrust issue is something that, that continues now with the Obama administration. It's, a, it's an issue that we're seeing now with the whole Hamas Fatah pact, right? With Israel saying that the U.S. gave Israel assurances that they would not deal with, uh, with, 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 the, with the government, with the Palestinian government, even if Hamas just backs it. And the, and the Americans saying, no, we never made those kind of assurances. What's the problem here? The problem is if the U.S. wants Israel to take serious risks for peace, Israel is going to have to trust Washington completely, something that unfortunately we've seen has become more and more of a problem. Look, Israel's overall position on the settlements is that this is an artificial issue that's blown way out of proportion by the Palestinians for their own, for their own interests and their own needs. It's clear it's clear to everybody with eyes in their head that building more houses in Mali Dumin is not going to change the settlement map. It's not going to change the peace map. If you build more houses in Mali Dumin, you're not taking, you're not expanding on other land. This in no way is going to have any impact on the future peace map, especially if you believe, as most do, and it has been the case over the last 20 years of negotiations, that the main settlement blocks are going to remain a part of Israel. The same is true of building in Jerusalem, right? We hear in the news that Israel last week, they declared they're going to build 1,700, 1,500 more units in neighborhoods in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, in these, in these neighborhoods which are very, very much a part of the Israeli consensus. Believe me, building those homes in those neighborhoods does not change the peace map. These are not neighborhoods that are going to The big imponderable, the big thing that we, nobody really knows or we can't figure out to the largest extent, where is this all going, what's going to be with the settlements? There's a school of thought, and I touched upon this the other night, the school of thought that says, look, the Palestinians know that Israel is not going to freeze settlement construction in Jerusalem. It's just it's not going to do it. It knows it's not going to do it. Yet by making that a precondition to entering talks again, which, 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 which the Palestinian Authority leader uh, Mahmoud Abbas is doing, by saying he's not going to enter talks again until Israel freezes all settlement building everywhere, he knows that this is nothing that's going to happen. 
that this is not something that Israel can ever agree to. So there are those who say that he's making this a precondition because he doesn't want to get into the talks, because he knows that if, if he doesn't get into the talks, then Israel will be blamed for this anyhow. Right? So this is, this is kind, of, kind of a tactic, a Palestinian tactic to push off getting into negotiations, not necessarily wanting to negotiate a deal, and then ensuring that the blame for this will all fall on Israel. Israel also, in my view, is not going to engage in any, near, any, any time in the near future in any massive withdrawal of settlements, right? I don't think we're going to go repeat what we did in Gaza in 2005, although right now there are many different ideas floating around the Israeli political map about whether, again, you should take unilateral, unilateral action and you should remove some isolated settlements. I think the settlement issue, like I said in the beginning, I think the settlement issue, to a large degree, is a crutch. Israel has shown, has shown both by removing the settlements from Sinai in, uh, in the Camp David Accords and also by removing the settlements in Gaza in 2005, that for a real peace agreement, it is willing to make the trauma, or, or it is willing to go through the trauma. But I think in order for that to happen again in the future, it's going to have to be very, very clear what Israel gets in return. And before you do that, you're going to have to have very, very strict security, guides, security guidelines and security framework in place so that, in, if, so that you ensure that if you do remove the settlements, that you're not going to face the situation that you had in Gaza. I just want to close on this issue by saying, may, making one last uh, uh, observation. And that's, when people talk about the Jews in the West Bank, the Jews in Judea and Samaria, for some reason it's axiomatic, for some reason it's, 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 it's understood, or it's taken for granted, that in order for having an agreement with the Palestinians, that we have to remove every last Jew from the West Bank. That in order for there to be peace, there could be no settlements in the West Bank. Why not? Why not? Let's say there's peace. Let's say that a Palestinian state is established. Why is it that in my state, the state of Israel, I have a strong Arab minority of 20%, right? I have 11 Arab parliamentarians in the Knesset. I have Arabs on the Supreme Court. Why can I have an Arab minority in my state, but in a future Palestinian state, there cannot be a single Jew? Why does a future Palestinian state have to be Juden right? And I think that's a question that we have to ask. And why does the world accept the basic premise? The Palestinians say that there cannot be a Jew in the Palestinian state. There was a guy, at, uh, there was a senior official in the, in, in the prime minister's office who said to me something years ago that, that stuck in my head. He said, a true test of whether the Palestinians would be willing to live next to me in peace is whether they'll be allowed or they will allow any Jews to live inside a Palestinian state. And I think the fact that they are unwilling to do that or have articulated an unwillingness to do that, I think that's a question that many people have to ask. I just want to conclude, this is the, the, that's the end of my, my settlement thing, and I'll, I'll take some questions in a second, but I just want to conclude by, by saying one thing, and my, and my wife, we, we discussed this, First of all, you should know that, that, that your work, what you're doing here is, is, is greatly appreciated. I mean, I, I can't say it's greatly appreciated by Israel, but I don't speak for Israel. I can't even get my kids to make their bed, so I don't speak for Israel. But you should know that, that, that it's very heartwarming, both for my wife and I, to come to Norway. And our impression of Norway and the impression most Israelis have of Europe and Norway in particular is that it's very anti-Israel. And then you come here and you see something completely different, right? You see people who are they're investing their energy and their money to come out and talk about a conflict that is thousands of miles away that doesn't impact on you directly. And believe me, it warms our hearts. And I think it's extremely important. I think what you guys do is extremely important. Uh, the fact that you don't only allow the Palestinian narrative to be told, that you also give the Israeli side, I think that's extremely, extremely important. I think it's holy work, and I think that uh, I thank you, my wife thanks you, and if I could speak for the people of Israel, they would thank you. Thank you.